Now, back in 1930, there was an American astronomer named Carl Jansky. J-A-N-S-K-Y. Carl is with a K. Carl Jansky. And Carl Jansky built the first radio telescope ever. And he won the Nobel Prize for being the father of modern radio telescopes. He then, Carl Jansky, also built later a radio transmitter so he could beam signals to the heavens uh, that he could you know, uh, observe through his radio telescope. And so he would build a radio transmitter and to beam signals to the heavens. And that was in 1930s. Also in the 1930s, just to see what might happen, he, Carl Jansky, did transmit a signal to Cassiopeia. We're told it was at 14.3 megacycles to Cassiopeia. And if you can believe it, he got back an intelligent signal that was amplified and did not know, he did not know what it meant or who sent it, but it was an amplified message, meaning the message he got back from Cassiopeia of aiming it at that particular star system was a very overwhelmingly obvious intelligent signal. What he could not read because he didn't know the language, but it was a signal that was coming in crystal clear. And so when Carl Jansky died, he made notes of all of this, and all of his notes were t- immediately taken from his office by, quote, men wearing black suits. Mm. That should tell you something. The, uh, the, the book talked about how when he passed away, Men in black suits came in and raided his home, his office, and took all of his notes. Well, that doesn't sound strange to me, because the world is run by men in black. Now, in the mid-1940s, ten years later, a Scottish astronomer named Duncan Luan, L-U-N-A-N, Duncan Lunan, was working with Carl Jansky's radio transmitter. And this is a Scottish astronomer. And he, too, sent out a signal aimed at Cassiopeia. And he, too, got back a signal about 20 seconds later, both intelligent and amplified. And he didn't know what to make of it either. He didn't know what was being said. He couldn't read it, but he knew it was intelligently sent and very amplified. So somebody was definitely answering on that radio telescope. But Duncan Lunan narrowed the signal down to a star or a particular light in Cassiopeia, which today we call the Lunan object. Look it up in in an encyclopedia. L-U-N-A-N, Lunan object. It would tell you a particular star, a particular star or light in Cassiopeia constellation is where there's a powerful signal coming. When you send out a signal out to Cassiopeia, one comes back and it's coming back from a place called the Lunan object. Now, the word of God in Greek, as I've told you before, is Theos, T-H-E-O-S. Theos is God. And the chief Theos or God was called in our, in our, on our earth, the chief God over our earth was, the word is generally God is Theos, but the chief God over the earth is called Zeus, the God the Father of all other gods. He's supposedly the ultimate God over the earth in our particular area of the uh, Milky Way galaxy. So to the ancient Greeks in prayer, it would be, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Zeus. Now look at the word, Our Father, Father. In the ancient Sanskrit, which is the ancient Hindu Sanskrit, Father is Pita, P-I-T-A-R, Pita. And in the old Persian, the word for father is P-I-T-A. So Sanskrit is P-I-T-A-R, but old Persian is P-I-T-A. While in Greek and Latin, 
Father is Pater, P-A-T-E-R, Pater. This is where we get the, the term Pitter Patter. Pitter Patter is the name for God in Sanskrit, Old Persian, Greek, and Latin. Pitter and Pater. So the ancient words for God was Pitter Patter. Again, in ancient Greek, the Father God was Zeus, spelled Z-E-U-S. And since he was the Father God, he was our Father, the Holy Father in Heaven, he would be, that would be spelled Z-E-U-S hyphen P-A-T-E-R, Zeus Pater, or God the Father. So in Latin, the word God is not Zeus, Z-E-U-S, but in Latin is D, D-U, D-E-U-S. <clears throat> God in in the ancient world was Z E U S, but in Latin it's D E U S. So you interchange the Z with a D. So in ancient Rome, God or Zeus was called in the ancient Roman Empire. Go back and read it. You will see that Zeus was called in Rome I U capital I U hyphen. Peter, P I a P E T E R I U Peter. I's are of course interchangeable with J's, so that Zeus or I U Peter becomes J U Peter or Jupiter. Right. So Jupiter was the king of the gods in Rome, which is Jew Peter, for God the Father, Zeus. So in the day, so today I've been there to the Vatican, and in the Vatican today there is a statue of the Apostle Peter. <clears throat> that encyclic, the encyclopedias the world over will tell you right. that the Apostle Peter's statue in the Vatican is not Peter but Zeus, Pater. The Roman Zeus was called J U Peter or Jupiter. So today, Catholics and Christians around the world that go to the Vatican are still on their knees praying to, and in the Vatican in particular, actually kissing the feet of the Apostle Peter, which is actually Jew Peter, Zeus. So well, today right, in the yeah. central... Well, I was, just, again, I was just going to say that uh, when, when I was learning to translate Latin, uh, th- this is exactly what came up, is that Jupiter is effectively Zeus, and Jupiter, the the way it's written in Latin, it's written a, c- a couple of different ways. And uh, one of them does involve the uh, the, the patri, patriarum, you know, j- just yep. like we, we, we use the word patronage or paternity or, uh, you know, patriarch, you know, these kinds of words all come from this, uh, from this, uh, root Latin for father, which, uh, which you just got ex- done explaining, but it is part of the, the word for Jupiter, which is the highest of the, uh, Roman gods when they were using Latin. So. That's right. Um, there you go. It, 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 it's interesting that, uh, that they actually maintain almost the same pantheon. It's a slightly different one from the Greeks. There's a yep. slight difference, right. but just uh, a little bit, yeah. just a little bit of a difference, yeah. But you know, the but, Romans, yeah. Romans got most of what they got from the Greeks anyway. Well, right, but both uh, sets of what people generally refer to as mythology actually mm-hmm. contain these muses too, which is another thing. I, I know I'm going back to it again, but here's the thing: today, this also survives, you know, in, in a poetic. Uh, sort of uh, interesting creative writing way, right? Where people discuss a muse, and a muse generally means an inspiration, which uh, drives one toward creativity when it's used in this way. And it is uh, something that is not really fully quantifiable. A lot of times in love poems, for instance, uh, uh, Jordan, lit- in, a, in a literary sense, j- just to take a look at what is still in use today, one might say that, uh, you know, the woman they're in love with when they're writing love poems is their muse for writing it because they are the inspiration. They're not really sure how this all comes to them, but they seem to be inspired by just the mere thought of, not necessarily even the person, but just the mere thought of. So 
the mm-hmm. spirit of the individual drives them to create the love poem. I know it sounds a little convoluted, but it's literally where this reference uh, uh, still survives today, uh, as well in, as in all those words you mentioned before, amusement, museum, music, uh, so on and so forth. But it's just uh, kind of interesting that the echoes still remain, even when the meaning seems to have changed. And, That's uh, right. The, and, and you're showing the complete passing of time here by, you know, by showing us Zeus to Jupiter. Cause that was always an odd thing for me when, you know, when they were teaching me about Latin and I was doing the proper classes on it, right? Um, I'm sitting there and I'm looking at it saying to myself, how is it that they got from one to the other? Uh, <laughs> you know, like they, nobody explained that there. They just wanted you to know that's what this means. Um, but it, but it was interesting to, to take a look at how, you know, the, these words continue to survive and the reason why they mean what they mean. It, it, it begins to make sense and, uh, also see Jordan's work on how English is a designer language. But anyway, uh, back to the story that you're telling us here. Uh, and, and that this is really fascinating about these communications from Cassiopeia or Cassiopeia because, uh, according to the mainstream records, if you will, there's only ever been one signal that they can't, you know, that what they call the wow signal, right? That, uh, uh-huh. that seems to be intelligent that nobody can quite explain, but then others have tried to explain away. Um, these two other interactions where they beamed a signal directly to a particular point given this information and then received something back, you don't see this spoken about in a lot of places, Jordan. I wonder why that is. Yes, I wonder why. Because the governmental system on the earth does not want you to know what they know. They're in a superior position to know everything, and you are in the inferior position. And basically, as George Carlin said, it's a big club, and you ain't in it. Mm -hmm. So they're not about to tell you what they know. They already know things about the world we live in, and the heavens, and the gods, and the spirits. The governmental systems in this world are well aware of this kind of knowledge, but they're not telling you. Why? Because they are no possible way they are equal to the powers in the heavens over the gods. And so they don't want you to know. They want you to think that they are the most powerful force in all the universe, the governmental structures in America. They believe themselves to be almighty gods. And they don't want you to know that they know that there are extraterrestrial life forms out there that are far, far more powerful and frightening and they will not be able to deal with them. And they know that. They will not be able to deal with the powers of the gods, the spirit creatures, these extraterrestrials. And they don't want you to know that they are scared to death of these things. That's why they quietly are researching UFOs and aliens and all kinds of other world stuff that's going on because the government knows they're out there for sure and that they cannot do anything about it because whatever's out there is far, far more superior to anything the earth has. And so they don't want you knowing that because then you will not turn your attention to the government. You will turn your attention to the gods. Mm. Well, even worse and, than that, Jordan, uh, the possibility that would then exist if this was a, uh, a relatively open secret, let's just say, mm-hmm. um, we could literally find a way, devise a way, possibly, you know, some of us are still intelligent, so, <laughs> you know, haven't been entirely dumbed down by the school systems and the vaccines and everything yet, Um there, there is the possibility that someone could not only figure out a way as these two gentlemen that you mentioned so far to beam a transmission to, uh, and to receive something, but who knows, maybe even interpret it. And in that way, uh, a direct access line to the God, uh, or the chief deity, so to speak, um, that almost opens up the possibility for having prayers answered for real. I mean, yeah. <laughs> in, in a direct way, like, look, this evil government is upon the planet and plaguing your people, and I am speaking to you, and who knows what you have to say to said chief deity, because I don't believe that all of the bowing and scraping that we're taught to do is exactly right. So, seems to me like, or at least it's not for that God, seems to me like if you did figure out a way to communicate with and to request help from properly... Well, that would cause a lot of problems for all those people who think they have power and sway over this world, wouldn't it? 
wouldn't it? If they, if we were to contact the actual spiritual powers that are in fact over this earth and are watching us, and they that it won't interfere with us until we ask for help. I mean, we do the same thing. We could see a child trying to put a toy together, and he's busily trying to figure out how to put this toy together, and the father's sitting there watching him. And until the child finally decides he's just not going to be able to do it, he turns to his father and said, would you put this together for me? Then the father could say, okay, now that you asked me, yes, I will do it. I could have done it for you to start with. But I didn't want to interfere in your life. You wanted to play with it and try and fix it. Let's see if you can do it. If you can't, then ask me and I will intervene in your behalf and I will fix it for you. Mm. So that's what we're waiting on. That's what the gods are waiting on for us to contact the actual, in fact, spirit powers over this earth and ask them to help us get out of this mess. And that's the only way the human family is going to survive is if we have intervention from out there. Mm. 